Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the last video we wrote some code to smoothly move and rotate the camera around and we used the input system for getting the mouse and keyboard input from the user. In this video we'll start by spending a few minutes on fine tuning the camera speed and we'll continue by adding input binding capability to our input system. Let's lower the camera move speed and see how that feels. This looks okay at 60 frames per second. I'd like to see how it behaves at higher frame rates though. Well, you can see right away that the movement speed is faster for higher frame rates. In order to make it frame rate independent, we can multiply the speed values with the frame time. Higher frame rates have smaller frame times, which will lower the movement speed. I divided dt by the frame time at 60 frames per second, because we are visually fine tuning the camera speed at 60 frames per second. So that's kind of the normalizing factor, if you will. Now the movement speed is the same for all frame rates. One more thing that I notice is that although the camera movement gradually comes to a halt when we release a key, it doesn't have the same behavior when we start moving. In other words, there is an ease out function, but there is no ease in function. To add one, I'll add an acceleration factor for the position. As long as we are pressing a key to move the camera, we increase its value up to a maximum of 1. We should also scale this value for the frame rate. Multiplying the amount of change in position by the value of position acceleration will create the desired effect. If we are not holding a key, we reset the position acceleration to zero. Now you can see that we have more control over how the camera starts moving. And we have the same behavior in the debug build at 60 frames per second. <laughs> 
I'm sure there is a lot that can still be improved for camera movement, but I think it's good enough for now. Next, we'll have a look at this part of input handling. As you can see, we are checking for key states every frame from which we calculate the movement. This has a couple of drawbacks. First, as a game programmer, I'd like to spend my time writing the gameplay logic and not doing input handling. Second, if you do it this way, you'd have to repeat this code for every script that uses input to move things around. And last but not least, it just ain't pretty. We could fix this by letting the input system handle it through input binding. Using input bindings, we can define a binding and attach input sources to that binding. It would then raise an input binding event whenever any of those input sources changed. Here we add a function that binds an input source to a binding key that comes with the input source. We also add a function that unbinds an input source. Here we only need the input type and input code. We can even have a function that unbinds all input sources and removes the input binding altogether. We can define the data structure for input bindings as an array of input sources, the resulting input value, and whether the binding sources have been changed so that input value needs to be recalculated. We can access each input binding using an unordered map. In addition, we can link each input source to an input binding, again using an unordered map. Let's implement these functions so we can see how this data is used. Starting with the bind function, first we generate a key from the input type and input code. Then we call unbind in order to remove the current binding of this input source if it has one. Remember, each input source can only be used in one input binding. And then we add this input source to the list of sources in the corresponding input binding. Note that if no input binding with this key exists, it will be created first. Finally, we add the binding key to the list of source bindings, so we can easily look up which input source is used in which input binding. To remove an input source from a binding, we check if it has a binding first. If it doesn't, then we can simply return. Otherwise, we need to get the binding key from the source binding map and use that key to look up the input binding data. In the list of input sources, if we find an item with the same input type and code, then we can remove it. At the end, if the collection of input sources is empty, then we can remove the whole input binding. For the unbind function that removes all input sources from an input binding, we first check if it exists. If it does, then we loop through its input sources and remove them from the source mapping. At the end, we remove the input binding itself. 
In order to use this, we need to evaluate input bindings whenever an input source value is set. That happens when the user does something with the mouse or keyboard. In that case, we check if the input sources is used in any input binding. If it is, then we get a reference to that binding and set its dirty flag, because we are going to have to recalculate the resulting input value. First we need another getter function that will give us the input value of a binding. This function will also evaluate the binding when the dirty flag is set, otherwise it will just return the input value. We then take this input value and raise the binding event. We don't have an onEvent function for binding events, so let's write it now. First, we need an additional event handler function pointer type. Another private data type for binding callbacks. And an array of binding callback function pointers. Then we need a function that adds such a function pointer to this list. It's pretty much the same as the one for input events, except we also have a binding key that we need to check for. So we add a new item to the list of input callbacks, if we don't already have a function pointer with this binding key in there. Now we can add another virtual function to the base class and implement it in input system class. This function is called when a binding event was raised. Similar to an event function for input, it goes through all callbacks with the given binding key and calls each one of them with the resulting binding value. Now we can complete the code in input setter function by calling an event with the binding key and binding value. One more thing that we need to do is to implement the getter function for binding values. We return if no input binding exists with this key. Otherwise, we get a reference to the binding. If its dirty flag is not set, it means that we don't have to evaluate its value and we can just return it. If the dirty flag is set, we get a reference to the collection of input sources and check the state of each one of them. For the mouse, I kinda still need to figure out what would make sense, because mouse position has a free range and I can't really use it to calculate a meaningful value. So consider this part as to be improved in the future. For other types of input, we can get the current and previous values and add them to the result. 
Note that we are mapping the values to the axis that is set by the user when they created the input binding. At the end, we assign the resulting value, clear the dirty flag, and also return the result. Now let me show you how we can create and use input bindings. In the initialize function in test renderer, we can add an input source which we can use to create bindings. I'll create a binding for movement using keyboard. For example, the A and D keys are used to move to the left and to the right. The multiplier defines the direction, and the axis defines the movement axis. In this case, we'd like to move along the X axis. We call the bind function to bind each key. The W and S keys are used to move in the Z direction, which is the same as moving forward and backward. Finally, we can use the Q and E keys for moving vertically or in the Y direction. In our camera script, we can now use this binding instead of getting these key states. To do so, we call input get with the binding key and just use the value that's returned. And when we shut down the application, we are going to unbind the move input binding. As you can see, we can now move around the scene just as before, but our script code is now simpler. This wraps up the first draft of the input system for Primal Engine. I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, thank you so much for joining me today and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time. Until then, take care and happy game engineering.